Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich wünsche Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to wish you a very good morning. The sitting is thereby resumed. And we shall move on to the first item on the agenda, which is declaration statements from the Council and the Commission about measures, EU and Member State measures to tackle the flow of refugees as a result of the conflict in Syria. The first speaker is the representative of the Council, Minister Lescovicius. Minister, you have the floor. Good morning, the President, honourable members. During the last two years of conflict in Syria, we have been witness to a number of tragic milestones, but early September saw a particularly depressing one. The number of refugees registered or awaiting registration passed to million. More than half of them are children, another quarter are women. As I speak to you today, the number of refugees from Syria has risen yet again to more than 2.1 million. Not only is this an appalling reality for those who, whose lives are marred by traumas, violence and displacement. It also constitutes a huge challenge for Syria's neighbors. And unless things change for the better inside Syria, the UN estimates there may <coughs> be almost three and a half million refugees by the end of this year. In recent months, in particular, the number of Syrian nationals heading towards EU member states has significantly increased. The Council has been following with great concern developments in the Syrian crisis and is aware of the potential challenges to member states of increasing migratory pressure from nationals fleeing from Syria. The issue was discussed most recently at yesterday's Justice and Home Affairs Council. At that meeting, ministers reiterated the firm commitment of the EU to step up assistance to those affected by the crisis. The Council also received a report from the Commission on the results of a recent fact-finding mission to some of those EU member states most directly affected by migratory pressures from Syria. We are aware that the scale of this plight places an enormous burden upon the governments and host communities in Jordan, Lebanon, and in Iraq and Turkey. We therefore commend Syria's neighbors for having kept most of their borders open, providing safe haven for those who have lost everything. We strongly encourage these countries to continue on this path. At the same time, we acknowledge the international community's responsibility to share part of this burden by offering support to those who so generously host large numbers of refugees. The EU and its member states have been at the forefront of providing assistance in response to the Syria crisis from the outset. Almost every member state is seeking to help alleviate the suffering of the Syrian people, both inside and outside the country. This is despite the current difficult economic climate and, in some cases, very strict budgetary constraints. To date, EU humanitarian funding for a Syria crisis stands at more than 1.5 billion euros, with two-thirds coming from the member states. A further 412 million euros has been mobilized through non-humanitarian EU instruments, a large part of which will benefit host communities and local societies. This brings total funding by the EU and the member states to more than 1.9 billion euros. The EU has also called on donors to increase their coordination and ask humanitarian partners to reinforce the monitoring of their activities so as to help provide an overview of the assistance being provided and so ensure better accountability towards our citizens. This action to address humanitarian needs must be strengthened, given the lack of any immediate prospects to an end to the conflict. But the EU is also considering measures over the medium and long term. 
the objective of the EU is not only to provide assistance to refugees, but also to support the countries and communities in the region affected by the current refugee flow. The Commission, in close cooperation with the relevant international partners, is preparing a regional protection program, which is specially designed to address the medium and long-term challenges of the Syrian humanitarian crisis and is expected to start functioning early next year. The Council yesterday welcomed the progress toward the establishment of this program and invited the Commission to continue this very important work. The resettlement of Syrian nationals in need of protection and the relocation of refugees between EU member states are among the measures currently under consideration at EU level. These measures can benefit from funding through the European Refugee Fund, which will become the Asylum and Migration Fund. When negotiations between the Council and the uh, European Parliament are concluded, Mr. President, Commissioner, Honourable Members, we are focusing this morning one, uh, on the particular issue of the plight of refugees, but we must not lose sight of the most important goal, ending the violence and heading towards a peaceful and democratic transition in Syria. We have consistently emphasized the need for a political solution, the only possible solution to this war, and the need for a Security Council to act and effectively end this conflict. The High Representative has welcomed the uh, United Nations Security Council resolution on Syrian chemical weapons as representing a major step towards a sustainable and unified international response to the crisis in Syria. It follows on from the important decision taken by the OPCW Executive Council in The Hague. This decision should pave the way to the elimination of chemical weapons in Syria and set a standard for international community in responding to threat posed by weapons of mass destruction. The legally binding and enforceable resolution condemns the attacks of 21st August and calls for accountability for this crime and envisages a forceful international reaction in the event of non-compliance. The EU has reiterated its readiness to support actions foreseen under the resolution as well as under the decision uh, of the OPCW Executive Council and we are indeed in contact with them to discuss practical support. We need to take full advantage of this momentum. Internationally, we have continued to work with all partners, with the US, with Russia, the UN, with many Arab nations to achieve a united international response. The United Nations Security Council resolution contains a very clear endorsement of the Geneva Agreement reached on the 30th June 2012 and calls for the convening of the follow-up conference as soon as possible. Mr. President, honorable members, over the past two years, the Syria conflict has deteriorated into a full-blown civil war. The need to provide innocent Syrian civilians with humanitarian assistance is greater than ever before. The EU and its member states have made outstanding contribution to this effect and will continue to be among leading the way to securing further funding. Most importantly, we are increasingly pooling our resources and the Presidency is ready to play its full role in this endeavor. The Council takes note of the Parliament's draft resolution on the table today. It proves once again the tension with which this Parliament has been following the appalling situation in Syria and uh, its uh, spillover effects in the whole region. In humanitarian assistance, as in other policy fields, it is clear that we can act most effectively when we coordinate among ourselves and build on the particular trends and experience of the EU, of its institutions and of each and every member states together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Now,
Commissioner Barnier will make a statement on behalf of the Commission. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me thank the Parliament for having tabled the debate on this urgent, indeed tragic, subject. Commissioner Georgieva is in New York and Cecilia Malmström is with President Barroso in Lampedusa this morning, so they've asked me to speak on their behalf and it's my honour to speak on behalf of the Commission after the representative of the Lithuanian Presidency. First of all, the minute of silence that was observed by Parliament, I'd like from the Commission to express the condolences that we feel and the solidarity we feel with the victims and the families of the victims of the tragedy in Lampedusa a few days ago. A large number of men, women and children who died there were of course fleeing from the conflict in the Middle East and in Africa. Honourable members of the European Parliament, recent international initiatives and in particular the Russo-American Agreement on the uh, monitoring and destruction of chemi the chemical weapon weapons arsenal in Syria and the UN resolution have made the possibility of a military response as uh, mentioned by the US and its allies recede. That doesn't necessarily mean however that the situation in Syria is becoming more stable. On the contrary, military operations on the ground are continuing. And the Union, through the voice of its High Representative, my Vice President and colleague Cathy Ashton, has frequently stressed the need to continue the search for a political solution, a solution which is the only way of putting an end to this war and would obviate the need for the UN to act. So we need to put an end to the conflict. We have constantly said that we stand ready to support everything stipulated in the UN resolution as well as the OEAC Executive Council decision. We remain in touch with OEAC to evaluate how to provide assistance on the ground. Catherine Ashton believes that we're at a crossroads as far as the conflict is concerned. It's important to realize how serious and how significant this moment is for the international community. We're going to continue to work with all our partners, obviously the United States, but also Russia and Arab countries, the United Nations, in order to come up with a political response from the international community, one we can all sign up to. The resolution clearly backs the Geneva Agreement signed on the 30th of June 2012 calling for a follow-up conference to be convened as quickly as possible. As Minister Leskovicius clearly said, and this is why we've got the debate this morning, this is one of the most serious international crises we've seen. The half third of the population has been displaced. Two million refugees have made themselves known to the UNHCR in neighboring countries and Lebanon, a country I'm familiar with personally, but also Turkey, Iraq and Egypt. On behalf of the Commission let me stress the commitment that we feel with the authorities and the people of these countries and we'd like to hail their performance as far as refugee reception is concerned. The High Commission for Refugees considers that by the end of the year the number of Syrian refugees still in the region, in neighbouring countries around Syria will reach far 3 or even 3.5 million people. The Union is in the front line of aid givers to these displaced persons. More than €2 billion Euros have been committed since the end of 2011 by the Commission and by Member States, monitored of course by your Parliament President, to support humanitarian efforts. The European Union is by far the biggest donor 
in the crisis and we however are approaching certain limits in 2013. Let me make it clear that 56%, more than half of our humanitarian aid, pledged by Commission and Member States, is earmarked for Syria's neighbours. 44% is earmarked for, and we're trying to send it to, Syria itself. Neighbouring countries, particularly Jordan and Lebanon, are making it known that their reception capabilities are being stretched to and have now more or less reached their limit. The European Union is doing all it can to make sure that Syrian refugees in all neighbouring countries receive sufficient humanitarian assistance as well as legal protection. Honourable members of the European Parliament, a regional protection programme supplementing the first short and medium term programme is being drawn up. We're working closely with member states and our international partners on this. The regional protection programme, one which aims to demonstrate solidarity, should deal with protection, but also development initiatives which will be implemented in Jordan, the Lebanon and Iraq where not just Syrian refugees will benefit but also other refugees from other countries and other host communities will benefit too. Antonio Guterres, the High Commissioner for Refugees, launched an appeal that we should lodge 10,000 Syrians in Europe and uh, rehouse some of the most vulnerable, Germany, Finland, Austria, Denmark, Hungary, Luxembourg, Sweden, the Netherlands, Ireland have all decided to allocate a certain number of places for and provide a humanitarian assistance for Syrian refugees. Let me thank these member states on behalf of the Commission for their solidarity and helping out in our collective efforts. I'd like to call upon other member states to follow this fine example. About 50,000 Syrians have been asking for international protection in Europe since the crisis broke out, 50,000 people. Most demands were lodged in Sweden and Germany. They're also, of course, taking different routes to reach Europe land routes through Turkey, Bulgaria, Greece or via the Western Balkans. They're going by sea, Turkey e to Egypt. We saw of course the Lampedusa tragedy means that some of them are trying to take longer routes and reach Italy. Also of course criminal networks and gangs are involved exploiting the wretchedness and despair of these refugees and migrants. The Lampedusa tragedy a few days ago demonstrated once again many serious and significant things. First of all, the behaviour, the solidarity showed by the local authorities and the local people. We want to pay tribute to that publicly, President. But also it showed at the same time we need to act more effectively and pitilessly against these criminal networks. And also we need to improve the quality and the extent of our solidarity and assistance programs in Europe. That's what Cecilia Malmström, my colleague, proposed yesterday addressing the Council of Home Affairs Ministers. Obviously, the flow of migrants towards Europe can't be compared with the number of those who have fled to the countries around Syria. I, I told you how many of those there are. But the number of people in despair trying to reach Europe is increasing and it is going to put pressure on national <coughs> systems as we've seen in Malta, uh, Cyprus or Italy. Member states of first entry, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Greece, where dozens of Syrian nationals arrive every day are of course most exposed. Italy has seen its figures increase, new arrivals who managed to cross the Mediterranean. 
we need to be prepared for the possibility of greater flows. Commission assisted by the Asylum Support Office and by Frontex with uh, Frontex new powers and working closely with the UNHCR and the International Migration Organization went to Bulgaria, Greece and Cyprus last week. The situation as we saw it shows how significant and important it is that we work together. It's gone beyond being a national question, it's now a European question and the answer is certainly not closing our borders. We certainly shouldn't try to close ourselves off. This is an area where we need more Europe and better Europe. This crisis affects all of us, it's so serious and we need to be ready to show more solidarity. Honourable Members, Mr. President, we've already set up a number of measures to support member states to guarantee a consistent cross-union approach, working with the International Migration Association and Frontex. We have a European Refugee Fund, we have a fund for our external borders and the European Return Fund. Joint coordinated operations run by Frontex in the Mediterranean and the South Eastern borders should be prepared to meet mixed migrant flows and reception states are taking part in these operations who have an enhanced responsibility to make sure that the union's rules are followed scrupulously and the principle of non refoulement be complied with. We'll now see how effective these methods and concepts are and how well adapted they are to the requirements of today and the increased burden we'll be facing in the future and we should be ready I believe to ask the budgetary authorities for more funds which I feel will be necessary. The funding could be supplemented through supplemented enhanced work of the ESAO and a strengthening of the team to help the member states most seriously affected. If the situation deteriorates further, as it might well, if we have therefore to expect more and more migrants reaching our borders, Frontex should be ready to enhance its joint operations and of course that means that member states will have to help as well, all of which will require additional financing to pay for the coordination of the operations although we're all aware of course of the budgetary constraints which we face. Civil protection in the European Union needs to play a role as well. You're aware of the work that we and I carried out as far as the European Civil Protection Force back in 2006. Krista Georgieva has been working on this for three and a half years. The idea is to provide a preventive response to pool national responses. We're not trying to create anything new here. We're trying to pool responses when it comes to uh, usually natural disasters but now uh, human disasters as well when Syrian refugees and refugees from other countries arrive. Another sensitive point, a final point, President, as far as the Syrian crisis and other crises in the region are concerned, there's also of course the terrorist threat that we face in Europe. The question of foreign competence. Number of combatants from the European Union travelling to Syria has been unprecedented compared with previous conflicts. We don't know that these combatants are definitely involved in extremist group activities, extremist groups based in Syria. There's no question they'll be able to tap into their knowledge and networks and carry out attacks against the interests of Western countries in general and, and Europe as well. So all these key elements which call clearly for us to show solidarity and a humanitarian as attitude, we should also be vigilant about European citizens going to Syria in order to fight and the threat they could pose to the security of the European Union. That President Honourable Members is the view of the European Commission, which I'm expressing on behalf of my colleagues Georgieva and Malmstrom. Once again, apologise that he can't be with us this morning. Thank you, President.
Kommissar, herzlichen Thank you very much. Grazie, Hafner. Herr Manfred Weber. President. That takes us to the debate. Now, Mr. Weber has the floor. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, 93,000 dead since the outbreak of the terrible civil war in Syria. According to the UN, about 2.6 million Syrian refugees outside Syria, 4 million displaced inside Syria. In Lebanon, uh, they're worried about the stability of the country and have banned the setting up of new refugee camps. Jordan and Turkey are doing an enormous amount to help. Ladies and gentlemen, the conflict we're experiencing in Syria is on our doorstep. From, Syri from Cyprus, we can almost see with the naked eye what is happening in Syria. Uh, colleagues, we have to appeal to those in power to stop and we have to rally all efforts to try to uh, stop the violence. I'd like to thank the Commission for its work to help refugees and to give Europe a presence on the Syrian scene. Europe must be ready to do more. Looking at Council, I see there's a reluctance to act. We have to take in more refugees on the basis of the UNHCR's decisions. We're hearing about problems with financing in 2013, but it's a disgrace for the European Union that we don't have an amending budget, that we're not able to live up to our responsibilities. Colleagues, given the terrible events in Lampedusa, we have to be aware that we have to distinguish between the persecuted and uh, illegal clandestine immigrants. The issue has to be on the European Council agenda. It has to be discussed. It's not a technical question. It's a question of whether Europe I is uh, human, uh, has a heart, and then we have to resolve the refugee problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Svoboda. Thank you. In the framework of our group, uh, we had the possibility to speak with uh, three refugees from Syria. One of them is Palestinian, and the young lady described the difficulty she had, especially as a Palestinian, because not all, Ar all Arab countries are very open-minded to Palestinian refugees. She came via a boat, or via the Mediterranean Sea with a boat. 100 people died during this uh, cruise. She had luck and could come to Europe. But they told us also that in spite of torture and imprisonment in Syria, they had the difficulties to get at least a permit for transitional stay in the European Union. And when I asked them, what do you want, what do you expect from Europe? They said very clearly, we want to go back, but perhaps you can give us some training, some expertise. Because it doesn't make much sense that if we have peace again in Syria, then European experts are coming for the reconstruction. We want to be the experts for reconstruction with the help of European Union. And I think this is the task we have to fulfill. And I fully agree, yes, we have to open our borders for limited numbers, for limited times, but we have to do it. And the Commissioner said that we are different in different countries. If you look to the figures of the refugees, if you look to the number of asylum seekers, or especially to the number of acceptance and recognition of asylum seekers, you have a big variety in Europe. Some countries do their job, some countries don't do their job. And therefore, Minister, I was very disappointed by the Home Affairs Council. A task force, another task force, 
We need action, not task forces. We know what we have to do. In our resolution, it is written what we have to do. That we have to do. And I agree with, in this case with Mr. Weber, I wrote yesterday to Mr. Van Rompuy, put the issue on the agenda of the next European Council in two weeks' time. It's not only an issue of the Ministers of, of Interior. We know there are limitations, professional limitations. It's an issue for all of us and all the government and the Prime Ministers have to do their job. Again, yes, we have to take the refugees, but it's not only give them in some places, give them the chance to learn here in Europe, to learn some skills, to learn about democracy, about freedom, about liberties. They want a Syria without Assad and without jihadists. They want a free Syria and we should give them the chance. Yes, in our resolution we ask the neighboring countries, please keep open your borders to Jordan, to Turkey, to Lebanon and others. Are our borders open? Very often they are not. So we should, should be very honest. We should be very honest. Why don't we create safe humanitarian corridors for the people to come? Why don't we create enough temporary accommodation for the people to come and give them, as I said, education and training. Yes, it's absolutely true. We have to stop that cruel war. The destruction of chemical weapons is a first step, but not, nothing more than a first step. And we have to continue our work until there is peace and conciliation in, in Syria. And then the people will come back. They don't want to stay. They will come back but they should have the chance to build a new Syria, as I said before. So let's together work that out of the tragedy of being refugees, these people get a chance, an opportunity to go back in their country, build a new Syria with skills and education and the philosophy of the European Union and European member countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker is Mr. Verhofstadt. Uh, immediately to ask to the Council and to the uh, Commission if they can agree on what the Parliament is proposing. The Parliament is proposing that we should organize a European humanitarian conference on this issue. That's the request of the Parliament in our uh, resolution. And I want to hear before the end of the debate if the Council can engage together with the Commission to organize this. And I think it's absolutely clear, the intervention of Mr. Weber and Mr. Swoboda are a clear indication that this is needed. And we cannot ask to the others to open their doors for the refugees and, and doing nothing ourselves, what is happening for the moment. I can tell you, Germany, Germany has given a temporary admission for 5,000 people. Sweden has, has given a permanent residence for 1,900 people. There is some little effort by Finland and that's it. There are some member states who are giving a quotum for 50 Syrian refugees. What is in fact a scandal on itself. It's cynical to do that. So the fastest as possible, we need a conference where the Commission and the Council and all the member states can make an agreement on a burden sharing for these refugees. So that at least everybody is doing more or less the same effort as countries as Sweden and Germany have done uh, the last weeks and the last months. And secondly, where we can also tackle the problem of the help towards Lebanon and Jordan. Lebanon and Jordan, we need them to give a direct budget aid and at the same time a macro financial assistance. Otherwise, these countries are not longer capable to uh, let enter this fleet of uh, refugees uh, in their countries. And then finally, I think also that we have to look into the question, is it yes or not necessary to activate the temporary protection directive as we did, you know, in the past uh, with Kosovo. What is a good solution? These people, as Mr. Svoboda rightly indicated, uh, are, are not, their intention is not to stay forever in the European Union. It's a temporary protection until we have solved on the international level uh, this uh, question. So my question is very clear, Mr. Barnier, and very clear to the, uh, the Minister of the Lithuanian Government. Are you ready to organize such a European uh, humanitarian conference? The Parliament is asking for, we want uh, to uh, participate, 
We think also that you have to invite the neighboring countries to this and the UN international agencies to this and actually representatives uh, from uh, the Syrian National Council and from other people working on the field. And then finally, uh, Mr. President, uh, I want to end my intervention by repeating what I already said. I think that uh, uh, the attitude of the international community towards the Syrian tragedy uh, is a shame and continues to be a shame. Yes, we have tackled the problem of the chemical weapons. I hope so, that we have tackled the problem of the chemical weapons. But the, what about the continuing massacres? by uh, the Assad regime. There are 1,000 people, more or less, have been killed by chemical weapons, but more than 100,000 people have been killed by other means, and we are still turning a blind eye to that tragedy. And I think in 20 years from now, in 20 years from now, in history books, we will be described as cowards, and maybe cowards we are for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sargentini. Thank you, Voorzitter. Er zijn heel Thank you. We have, we're all familiar with some of the figures that have been quoted today. Two million refugees outside of Syria and four million refugees within Syria and that in Turkey and Lebanon and other countries there are huge numbers of refugees. And what are we doing? Well, we're seeing that Jordan, Turkey and other countries, Lebanon for example, should remain willing to take in refugees and once again we're taking out our wallets and we're going, uh, or we're going on to our knees and basically that's all it is. The UNHCR has looked at this and there's about 8,000 refugees that are being allowed to settle in Europe and Mr Verhofstadt has, has mentioned a number of member states, Sweden for example and there's one country that has uh, agreed to 50, 50, my own country in 2013, 50 refugees. This is a scandal but the majority of countries in Europe have not ever taken, played their part in resettling peoples. I can give you an example of Lithuania, I can give you the example of Belgium. We have a Lithuanian minister who's told us about all of the things that Council wants to do and is going to do and again it involves taking out your wallet but really wouldn't it be a gesture if you were to say sir that Lithuanian would take 50, 100, 150 refugees and let them resettle there and ask the colleagues from the 27 member states to perhaps do something too. And if we were to do that, it would mean that it would be simpler for us to enter into negotiations or discussions with Jordan, Lib Lebanon and Turkey because taking out your wallet is not the only solution. And if we can't be generous in resettlement terms and we'll see disasters like we saw last week in Lampedusa and they will happen more and more frequently. This was a huge disaster. It wasn't the first one. As, uh, when we see the season coming we will see people drowning in the Mediterranean as long as Europe doesn't make it possible to apply for asylum for example in embassies or allows for resettlement, this kind of thing will continue to happen. I am expecting a gesture from the Lithuanian Presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Frau Kollegin. Thank you, Mr. Kirkup. Uh, Chairman, Commissioner, I do not believe in a common asylum system, but I do believe that this Parliament and our member states should do all we can to address the devastating humanitarian crisis sitting just across the waters of this continent through political will and financial and humanitarian assistance. The number of refugees that have fled Syria is beyond comprehension. And as these numbers grow, so does the probability that more people will risk their lives to reach our shores. I strongly believe that solidarity, cooperation between member states and meaningful assistance doesn't need to come in the form of legal compulsion, but instead in the form of a moral imperative, which has been acknowledged since the Geneva Convention. The best place to start when solving any problem is to be honest about the challenges that face us and the discussions as a consequence of the tragic events in Lampedusa are delivering lessons that we should have learned before. Our best hope of preventing further tragic loss of life and combating the massive pressures on member states' asylum systems is to be prepared. 
and that does not happen by burying our hands in the sand and hoping the problem will go away. This humanitarian crisis will not disappear from Europe's borders or our consciousness by us ignoring it. It's not just Italy or Spain or Malta's problem. This is illustrated by the numbers of Syrian refugees in Germany, Sweden and the UK. Therefore, I welcome the Commissioner's proposals to do more to watch Europe's borders at sea. We need to do more to combat human trafficking and to save the lives of the desperate who come here. We need to do more to make the aid we send to war-torn countries more accountable and more effective. And above all, we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Vimais. Thank you, Gabriela Timmer. Herr President. President, first of all, I would like to express my respect for the people in Lampedusa and the attitude that they have adopted. Now, they have helped other people and rescued them when their lives were under threat. And I think that this means that the criticisms that we've had of Italian legislation and our criticisms as to how between member states and at EU level we are reacting. I think that yesterday's meeting was a scandal for the EU. I think it has to be expressed clearly against the backdrop of this situation of a humanitarian catastrophe and our shared responsibility within the EU. I mean, we're talking about the fact and shouldn't we be changing something uh, to do with the uh, asylum policy in Europe? I mean, if we don't do something about it, then we are burying our heads in the sand. And let me make this point even more clearly. And I was very glad, Mr. Weber, to hear what you said. You are from the CSU. And the position that you have adopted here is one that I wish the German Minister of Home Affairs would espouse and take to heart. You know exactly what statements were made and here we can't say that we can't ask for more solidarity because if you don't want more solidarity then you are complicit in attacks on places where refugees are being put up and what we have to do is look at this conference for migration and asylum. We have to do something tangible to tackle the current refugee situation. Secondly, we have to change the way that asylum policy is structured. Thirdly, the opportunities which already exist need to be availed of so that member states can intervene themselves because there are some member states which are hugely affected by this crisis and there's and they are near to the or they are on the external frontiers of the EU and you know what opportunities already exist today but we have to make things simpler and only then will the European Union once again r gain some credibility when we talk about solidarity in the world and if you look at how many people per million inhabitants in Italy and Germany and other countries if you look at these figures and see how many people are being taken in per million people, then we're talking about so-called illegal people as well who live in Greece and elsewhere. And if we don't get to grips with this, if we don't open our eyes, if we don't look at this and put it on the agenda as a topic, then not just looking at Syria but looking elsewhere too, we won't be able to offer effective assistance. So. I don't think that this is worthy of us, this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Salavrakos. Thank you, President. The first strategic element in the destruction of the chemical weapons stock in Syria has begun. It's a very significant and positive step, of course. I think that the proposal shouldn't have come from President Putin. It should have come from ourselves. We need to be able to operate at a powerful level, a level that sets 
an example because we are the people who will ultimately be paying the price for the mistakes made in Syria. The UN has said that two million people have been displaced in Syria and 10,000 people have fled the country and have arrived in the European Union. That's 10,000 out of 2 million. That's a very small number. And we need to work harder because Greece has about 3 million immigrants at the moment. And people are talking about this 10,000 as if that's a huge number compared with what we have in Greece. It's not. And don't forget that the whole problem of migrants is far more intense in Greece than in other member states of the European Union. That we all know the tragic consequences that the conflict in Syria has had on the civilian population and there's a severe danger of spillover into neighbouring states. Let's help the Syrians all we can. President, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now Mr. Stadler at the end of the group speakers round. No, no, colleague. Mr. President, colleagues, the Syrian tragedy has happened partly because of a failed EU-Syria policy and a failed EP-Syria policy. Too early we took the side of the so-called Syrian opposition and supported terrorist networks. The Commissioner has mentioned these. There are hundreds uh, of thousands of refugees, including uh, Christians fleeing Syria. Some of them have uh, reached Austria and describe uh, horrific uh, things uh, done to them by people bankrolled partly by uh, countries like Qatar. Uh, we, ha we are wrong to have supported this, these networks. Qatar and Saudi Arabia are rich countries, the highest uh, uh, per capita income, they should pay for the refugees. They're responsible for the mercenaries that they've sent to Syria. They're funding arms uh, supplies to the terrorist networks. They are paying, uh, bankrolling this tr terrible tragedy, and it's a shame that we don't mention it in our motion. Thank you. And now I give the floor to the Commissioner to respond to some of those issues. Vice President Barnier, you have the floor. President, thank you for allowing me to intervene at this stage of the debate so I can reply directly to the appeal, the call from various honourable members, Mr Weber, Mr Svoboda, Mr Verhofstadt, Mrs Sargentini, Mr Zimmer, Mr Kirkup, all of whom raised the question of refugees and talked about the need for a European con conference on this. I say yes, on behalf of the European Commission, yes. I believe that such a conference isn't simply useful but necessary at a time such as this. It needs to examine various questions and allow us to do what we've not always managed to do, learn from this crisis that we need to learn from every crisis. The question of humanitarian aid in Syria and those frontline European countries that can't be allowed to tr handle this all by themselves. The question of refugees, the question of the fight, the implacable fight against the traffickers in men, women and children, which should be pursued with, by all means necessary. The need for civil protection, not doing more necessarily but doing better and doing it together. And we can do that if we have political commitment. The question of development and stability of that country and other countries in the region so that people don't feel the need to leave in the first place. These are all questions that are sufficiently serious to be looked at together at the highest level. Heads of state and government, European institutions working with the UNHCR, Mr Verhofstadt, should get together and sit around the table. So I believe the answer from the Commission is and should be yes. Thank 
Thank you very much for that clear response. We'll hear later from Council. The next speaker is Madame Mathieu. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Following the terrible tragedy of uh, Lampedusa with the Syrian refugees, we are left wondering about our migration policy. It is uh, our duty to help the Syrian population and to afford them protection. According to the United Nations, there are more than two million Syrian refugees. The conflict is continuing and uh, there could be three million refugees by the end of the year. Neighboring countries uh, should be uh, supported. They have opened their borders and are helping uh, the Syrian uh, refugees stay in the region. The EU should continue to help those neighboring countries who've taken in 97% of the conflict's refugees. Two billion euro have been released by the European Union and we should continue to work for peace in Syria and stability in the region in the interest of its whole population. Commissioner, we welcome your reply to MEP's questions. We appraise your attitude to the European Parliament's proposals, but there is a wider problem. How do we deal with refugee flows into Europe? Commissioner Malmström has uh, tried to work on this, but what can we do to have more solidarity, more burden sharing? At the moment, the member states are not prepared to sit round the table and hear out Commissioner Malmström. That's a great shame. Commissioner, the speaker is cut off. Thank you. The next speaker is Madame Guillaume. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Like you, I heard the proposals made and the response made by Commissioner Barnier, something which we've been calling for for some time, that the whole question of migratory flows be looked at in the round and not simply individually because we've not been able to come up with a global response that's commensurate with the difficulty. So thanks very much for that response, Commissioner, and we will see how the Council reacts too. Let's hope that they don't simply have an accumulation of national responses passing as a Council response, and nothing ends up being done to help displaced people and refugees. There's just an aspect of the resolution I'd like to touch on, President, on the question of asylum. Obviously, budgetary strengthening and logistical assistance to neighbouring countries around Syria is important, but it's not enough, in my opinion. Europe needs to share its burden of, or share the burden of responsibility for this. Otherwise, the common system that we took such a lot of time to put together would just be an empty shell if people who need protection won't be able to get safely to Europe. Otherwise, they'd be forced to come illegally, which in the end would hurt us. So let's make sure that Europe's doors are open. We do have ways of keeping corridors open to allow people to reach Europe. We need to provide more humanitarian aid, facilitate the granting of visas. France has promised it will take its share as well, and it's vital that we work with the HCR to open new corridors. Let's show real solidarity with Syrian refugees and the countries which host them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wikström. Thank you, President. The humanitarian disaster in Syria is of gigantic proportions. Human suffering is terrible. It is now high time for us in Europe to demonstrate that European solidarity does exist and each and every one of us in each and every country have to shoulder our responsibility 
to help the most vulnerable. And the best way to do this now is to offer quotas of refugees from Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan. Jordan uh, by offering them protection in all of the member states of the EU. We have in Sweden have taken on 1900 and in Germany over 5000 have been given protection and other countries are following the example and if everybody was on board we could help and give protection to hundreds of thousands of people now. The next step obviously would be that we hold this important conference that we've been talking about and subsequently we'd have to ensure that we can allow legal and safe protection for people. For example, it, by issuing humanitarian visas in temporary consular offices in refugee camps around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Merci. Je laisserai volontiers uh, ma minute de... Thank you. I'm quite happy to hand over my minute to the Lithuanian minister if he has anything to tell us. Your silence, sir, is deafening. You told us of your pleasure at this emergency debate. You said you welcomed the motion for resolution. But I wonder, have you read this motion for resolution? Did the ministers at yesterday's JHA Council look at our proposals? Did they think about what needs to be done in response to our debate today? Minister, I understand you've taken note of the situation. I understand that you're going to talk about it again at your next meeting, but Minister, the situation is urgent. The time to take measures is now. All of the colleagues in this House are telling you the same thing. The European Union has a whole series of instruments, policies, a big toolbox, various opportunities that it can use, and yet, Minister, we are hearing nothing. Please stand up, take the floor, and tell us what Council thinks. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Van Hecke is not yet with us. Mr. Borghezio. Three points, President. First of all, go beyond Dublin so that they be, these refugees be shared out between all countries. Germany has to sh shoulder too heavy a burden. Secondly, human trafficking. Tough penalties and international tribunal make it not find the people responsible for Lampedusa and we're not doing anything about even the man who helped sink the Costa Concordia. Also Commissioner Barnier talked about countries which are interested in, in hosting some refugees, didn't mention Italy. I'm President Barroso is in Lampedusa and he's going to speak to uh, President Letta about this, but I'd ask Mr. Barroso to check into certain things. I don't like the way that certain politicians are trying to jump on the bandwagon and uh, get publicity out of this. And I do hope that Mr. Barroso will check into the conditions in which refugees are held. Frau Ninsky. Thank you, Mr. Ninsky. Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, today we're talking about solidarity. This is the key word here. The tragedy which has unfolded with Syrian refugees is something which tests European solidarity, puts it to the test. All member states have to take in refugees, not just those that suffer under the pressure of large numbers of refugees. According to Dublin 1, 2 and 3, only those countries that are directly affected by influxes have to take in refugees. Now, we have changed this and we've said that the, the, we can see a redistribution and different countries have different capacities. The capacity in, for Bulgaria, for example, is very low. And here, some people are talking about closing borders. Secondly, we need more resources 
to be given to countries which have large influxes and these resources have to be provided to build up border capacity so that these refugees stay in countries near their country of origin. Now you know that we have the border with Turkey. Bulgaria is a country which is a target for many, which attracts many refugees. Now this actually threatens our national security. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have to emit a signal. We have to remain showing solidarity. Kaiser. Thank you, Veronique de Kaiser. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Europe is not able to cope with the imminent humanitarian genocide in the Syria region. It is beyond description. The key is in Syria. Six million displaced persons in the country, two million refugees in the region, 6,000 new arrivals daily in Lebanon. Our assistance must therefore be concentrated there and our diplomatic efforts likewise. It's difficult but it is possible and the European Union is already active. I was in uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon a few days ago and I saw uh, the uh, conditions, the difficult conditions in which local staff were working uh, in uh, Damascus and in Lebanon. There are 21 international NGOs in Damascus working with the Syrian Ministry of Social Affairs to channel aid. There are 2,000 uh, rebel uh, groups some of them linked to Al-Qaeda and all of them are involved in uh, negotiations uh, to get uh, aid channeled through to the people. I also applaud the efforts of UNICEF. We should explain what is happening and we should support it through diplomatic activity. Commissioner Georgieva told me yesterday that somebody from her team had a visa to go to Damascus. I pay tribute to the European Union. We should give our diplomats the means of continuing humanitarian aid in Syria and to work for a diplomatic solution to the conflict. Thank you. Madame Schrake. Schrake. Thank you, President, Commissioner, colleagues. For two and a half years, we've been eyewitness to the horrible war in Syria. And politically and diplomatically, the EU has stood on the sidelines. While Syrians are facing the worst atrocities of what looks more and more like a proxy war that risks destabilizing the entire Middle East, there is no solution in sight and no deal on chemical weapons will end the humanitarian disaster, which will be on our doorsteps for years. The number of internally displaced persons and refugees and their situations are staggering. The EU has a lead role in offering funding for the humanitarian support and I would like to compliment Commissioner Georgieva for her efforts and her leadership. But we must strategize and organize and especially act with all stakeholders. So I'm glad to see that the EU will lead and organize a conference to meet the unprecedented appeal of the United Nations of which only one third has been covered which deals merely with food, shelter, medicine and other basic needs. We must step beyond the disgraceful discussions such as those in the Netherlands whether we would take 50 or 250 people into our countries while a country like Lebanon takes in 6,000 people a day a majority of which are girls and women. Winter is coming and we cannot leave these people standing in the cold. Thank you. Thank you, females. Thank you very much. Mrs. Dodds, please. Thank you, Mr. President. The number of refugees uh, freeing Syria to escape this brutal civil war is deeply worrying. It is right that this situation receives the attention of Parliament this morning. I believe that it is important that those displaced by fighting in Syria are effectively protected by the international community. 
And while it is right that we do not intervene militarily, it is also right that we have a coordinated and compassionate humanitarian response. However, I am also deeply concerned by those still facing death and suffering within Syria. And this House should consider the position of Syrian Christians, the largest minority population within that country. Reports of killings directed specifically at them, reports of some jihadist rebel groups forcing conversions to Islam should be of grave concern to this House. I would urge the House, and particularly you, Commissioner, and your colleagues, in any ensuing debate, in any uh, follow-up conference, that you uphold the fundamental rights of Christians in Syria and that they are supported in every way possible. Thank you, Mr. Kollege Pierke. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierke. President, uh... President, Commissioner, esteemed colleagues, one loser of the Syrian crisis is already clear. The population of Syria, six million refugees, both within and outside Syria, are the result. I'm convinced that a genuine solution can only be a political one. And we've taken the first steps, and I hope that we'll see them succeed and that further steps could be taken. We're talking about short-term measures being necessary. It's absolutely indispensable for us to look at the camps, which have up to 150,000 people living there, to make them suitable for winter conditions so that people don't suffer from bad conditions in winter as well. So we have to look at infrastructure locally and n in the vicinity of the Syrian border it needs to be built up. We need to see schools being built because a large number of the refugees are children. Infrastructure building up drinking water facilities and sewage facilities are also extremely important. And thirdly, we have to draw attention to the Arab states that Europe is not the only country or region that has responsibilities and it, it, we have to ensure that Arab countries are also made aware of their duty to take in refugees f who after all come from the Arab world. I've spoken to a lot of people and my experience is that people want to stay in the region and be given assistance there so I think that they should be given support and assistance there so that as soon as possible after the conflict they can return home to Syria. Thank you. Mr. Lopez Aguilar. Gracias, señor Presidente. Thank you, President. The resolution on the conflict in Syria we're going to vote on requires the European Union to exercise its responsibility to protect the people of Syria and it doesn't just express compassion but solidarity too and it does so calling on member states and the whole of the Union to show solidarity too. It's not just enough to back the frontier countries, the border countries which are receiving all the displaced persons financially. It means that the Union has to use all the legislation at its disposal. Apply Article 27 of the visa regulation which allows humanitarian visas to be issued. It should employ Article 5 of the Schengen legislation which allows borders to be open temporarily for humanitarian reasons and it uses the funding available under the European Migration and Asylum Fund and that it also uses resources for permanent residents, not just, tempor not, not just temporary residents, so that it's not just those countries, Germany and Sweden, that have received most of the refugees so far, but they be shared out throughout the whole of the Union. And with the principle of non-reformance is vitally important too. Frog. Thank you, Frog. Thank you. Madame Giannacou. Thanks very much, President. It's clear in Syria that there's a dirty war being waged by a dictatorship and there are groups who want to use the excuse of overthrowing the dictator to introduce a theocracy. 
But there are four vital points. Let's do all we can, first of all, to get a political solution. That's the only real answer. Secondly, continue humanitarian and economic assistance to border countries overseen by the European authorities on the spot, President, so that we make sure that none of this ends up as this aid ends up being misused. Thirdly, it's vital that there be a European conference as the Commissioner mentioned. I congratulate him on that and Council needs to get involved as well. The European conference needs to reach conclusions for our general asylum policy and a refugees policy, how we can share out responsibility among the member states of the EU. There is a tradition of assistance to third countries, colleagues. There's a tradition in receiving refugees from all over the world here in Europe. But we need now to come up with a modern policy which will not, under, say, Dublin II, just share out the refugees among Mediterranean countries, but among all member states. And in particular, President, we need to send a message to the international community in the Western world that only working together will, will provide a hope for a political solution. Thank you. Thank you, our colleague. Thank you, colleague. Now, Mr. Engel. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh Thank you, Mr. President. Three points. All those who say that opening up neighboring countries' borders has consequences for Europe are right. Cyprus and Greece uh, are there, and we can't uh, just sit on our hands watching uh, Jordan, Lebanon taking in thousands of refugees. That would be unworthy of us. I think Commissioner Barnier has said some interesting things, certainly in terms of the countries that might be willing to take in refugees. I didn't hear many so-called large member states wanting to take in refugees. It's a shame that our uh, great countries are no longer quite so great. I'm also uh, glad of what Mr. Barnier said about non refoulement On the question of foreign combatants, there's a debate there that has to be had. W we know what is going on and we know what countries like Qatar are doing. Now those are partner countries of ours. Do we want Syria to collapse and do we want the massive refugee flows that would result? That's what we have to discuss. Thank you. Mr. Milan Mon. La cifra. The figure is huge. Two million refugees from Syria concentrated basically in Jordan, Libya, Turkey and Iraq. That shows what a tragedy the country is going through. And don't forget 100,000 people have been killed in the war. About a million of these are children. It's vital that we do something. The Union, as Commissioner Barnier said, is the most important country as far as providing humanitarian assistance to Syria. I'm pleased that the Commissioner also said that the Union is committed to helping find a solution to these problems. But apart from providing aid, we need to try and solve the underlying problem, make sure that the war in Syria ends as soon as possible. We can provide the best possible aid to refugees and the people, but we need to persuade people on the international stage, but also those in Syria, to look for a political solution to the conflict. It's vital that once and for all we have the whole the so-called Geneva II conference, which I do believe is going to start in November. The proposal from the US and Russia on destroying chemical weapons in Syria should be a 
a chance to move forward and find a solution to the war as a whole. We should hope that this leads to a speed up of the search for a solution to the conflict. That would be good for the countries receiving refugees who are also going through very difficult times. Thank you, President. Mr. Scoria Marco. Grazie, President. Thank you, President. We've managed to avoid an even more tragic situation than could have broken out in Syria, but we are seeing a flow of refugees not just to the Mediterranean countries but to other parts of Europe as well. The resolution we're debating today is extremely significant and I can agree to it, particularly because it puts forward a principle which can be applied to any emergency, not just Syria. Some countries have worked more in our European Union than others. Germany has received almost 15,000 requests. Sweden has about the same number. Our resolution's point is crucially important when it stresses that it's vital that we have a more consistent approach and show more solidarity among member states when it comes to receiving refugees, helping out those countries under most pressure. It's a kind of European solidarity clause. We're not just a grouping of states, we're supposed to be a union. And that solidarity needs to be shown no ifs, ands or buts. Countries like Greece, Cyprus, Malta, Italy are faced with these migrant flows every day and they can't handle it by themselves. Thank you. Dear Mr. President, over 2 million refugees, over 400,000 children aged up to the year aged up to 11, 6 million of people homeless. This is, these are not just the st statistics, not just numbers. These are human lives and we need to relate the Syrian tragedy to the tragedy in Lampedusa in order to make Europe react. And it would be completely wrong to uh, make this debate about the migration policies of the European Union. And my country has taken care of 800,000 of refugees during the aggression of Mr. Milosevic. And I remember my father, who was himself a refugee from the Second World War, and I've learned something out of all of this, and it is that it is most important for refugees to return back home. And this has to be the focus of our debate and our policies. Of course, we support this resolution, but primarily this parliament needs to communicate further with those democratic powers in the Syrian oppositions, those that will not persecute but rather protect Christians. And the goal of our policies needs to be that every Syrian citizen has the right to return to his home. Thank you, Ms. Essaya. Mr. President, Commissioner, there are more than two uh, million refugees that have left Syria. They're in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. Those countries need help and financial support. The Jordanian ambassador told our group in the summer that the situation was becoming a threat to Jordan's internal security. In addition to humanitarian aid, a number of EU member states have taken in refugees and asylum seekers, especially women and children. Germany 5,000, Sweden 900, Finland 500. Those are the uh, figures for quotas that certain countries are taking in. However, quota refugees uh, are only part of the answer. We need a, a ceasefire in Syria. We need humanitarian aid in Syria and uh, protection for the people there. Thank you very much. Now we proceed with, uh, with the catch the eye. Uh, colleagues, I have received uh, 15 requests and it will be extremely possible extremely difficult to satisfy everybody. So uh, we will have to take around seven or eight people. And firstly, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Zavlovieska. 
Dziękuję bardzo, Pani Przewodnicząca. Thank you, Madam President. According to a United Nations report on refugees in Syria, the number of refugees is rising, and every day more than 5,000 people are crossing Syria's border. It's a huge problem for the region's countries, which are taking in most of the Syrian refugees. I think that in the first instance, we should give help to refugees. We should not uh, try to stop illegal immigration. Bulgaria has complained of a mass influx of Syrian refugees, yet there are only 3,000 there, whereas there are 700,000 in uh, Lebanon. We should not uh, seek a greater destabilization of the region. Only 12 EU member states are committed to helping. I understand the difficulties some member states have with their budgets, but I have to say their problems are much smaller than the Syrian people's. Costa. Thank you, Mrs. Costa. Yes. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Madam President. I think we need to rediscover the meaning of the word solidarity. The situation in Europe isn't really changing in Syria despite the idea of the destruction of the chemical weapons, so Europe needs to take the role, the leading role in trying to find a diplomatic solution. Now we've got our resolution which looks at this refugee question as a European matter, not one of the individual states where the refugees arrive. I'm pleased that Commissioner Barnier has welcomed the idea of a European humanitarian conference. It's vitally important that we have not just European institutions but NGOs and other stakeholders as well. It's vitally important that we have a European Council dedicated to this matter as well because we need to look at the issue remembering that the situation in Syria is what's led to the refugee crisis. Let's look again at Dublin too and the question of asylum which only allows refugees to claim asylum status in the country which they first arrive, which is causing huge problems in Italy. There's also, of course, the question of trafficking. We need to look at that as well. Frequently, people arrive trafficked by criminals. We need to do something about that, charge them with crimes against humanity, as is possible under international law now. Thank you, says the President. Mr. Keller. Thank you. Over two million people have already had to leave Syria. Europe has taken in about 8,000 refugees, 8,000 compared to two million. That is nothing more than a cynical game. We need a comprehensive resettlement program with proper figures. Because if we're calling on the neighboring states to Syria that they should keep their borders open, we should open our borders and make it possible for legal avenues to flee and if we should act ourselves rather than pointing a finger at everyone else because we don't have to wait for a UN mandate to help people. We can do something tangibly to help these people and we shouldn't pass on the responsibility to the countries that neighbour Syria. Thank you, Mr Murphy. Thank you, President. The UNHCR has stated that Syria is hemorrhaging women, children and men. That metaphor uh, accurately gives a sense of the scale of the humanitarian disaster. More than two million have fled the country, over four million internally displaced. They are fleeing to try to escape a brutal civil war and to survive. By the end of the year, over 10 million people, more than half of the population, will be in need of humanitarian assistance. The scale of the movement also indicates how people do not trust or support either Assad or the leaders, the sectarian leaders of the opposition. What stands out here above all, though, is the hypocrisy of the EU. 
the open doors of some of Syria's neighbours are welcomed, but the closed doors policy of the EU remains, criminalising refugees, militarising European borders, with the tragic results that we have seen. The aid given by the EU so far amounts to 20 cents per, per day per person dependent upon aid. Much more money is needed and the EU must open its borders to these refugees. Investment is also necessary to provide all the necessary services, housing, education and so on for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Colleague Grzyb. Today we're talking about a humanitarian disaster in Syria. The UN Security Council has been dragging its feet over this conflict. More than 100,000 Syrians have lost their lives. Millions are internally displaced. Others are outside Syria's borders and those people need help. That uh, help is necessary to help the religious and other minorities who are suffering violence and persecution in Syria, Christians included. We're seeing non-Syrian terrorist groups have active in the country. That's destabilizing Syria's internal security. The EU's 2 billion euro assistance is inadequate. We all agree on that. But we need a political solution. The people of Syria need peace, the rule of law, and the right to return to their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Gomez. What should be the priority for Frontex and any other European agencies? Saving lives or pushing back people? Where lies the moral imperative for Mr. Barroso in front of the corpses in Lampedusa? Most member states' response to assist Syrian refugees has been disgraceful. We need a EU common asylum and migration policy. The focus on just humanitarian measures is bound to fail. Refugees will come out more and more as the war rages. The EU should use Syrian regime frozen assets to help support Syrian refugees and IDPs. But Syria will and should not be emptied of will not and should not be emptied of people. An effective channeling of aid to IDPs inside Syria requires a more effective EU presence at the borders in Turkey and other neighbours to support the right channels and not risk misappropriation by corruption, government and jihadist forces. The EU needs also to do more to help organise politically the Syrian opposition to prepare a democratic future for Syria. Thank you very much. Colleague Stoyano. Thank you very much indeed, Madam President. Our subject today is adopting measures for refugees. Have you been mentioning specific measures? Have any of you mentioned specifically any measures? I haven't heard of any specific measures. We've been talking and in the meantime hundreds of refugees have been coming over the frontiers into Bulgaria and Turkey and here Bul Bulgaria is the member state that has actually taken in the largest number of refugees now, unless you have forgotten or in case you have forgotten Bulgaria was the last uh, EU member state where an attack was perpetrated an Islamist attack and we shouldn't forget that because here we're talking about conferences, we're talking in the future, we're talking in the subjunctive, in the conditional and all the time 600 euros a day are being spent on refugees every day in refugee camps. Now I don't want to hear a minute of silence again because of all of this. You have the floor, yes. Madam President, Mr. Commissioner, civil war in Syria contains a new element not seen after Saddam's gas attack against its own people. A crime for what those guilty became duly punished. That's not a case yet in Syria. As now, it is agreed that chemical weapons per se now should be eliminated in one year, but nothing about elimination of killers is ever mentioned. 
so the terrorist impact on population that it may happen again still stays in place. It does contribute to further flow of Syrian refugees in all directions, including Europe. Therefore, the silence about Syrian crime against humanity being linked to impunity and legitimization of eventual war criminals works only on continued flows of refugees from Dia. Not the humanitarian efforts only should be organized on community scale, but the international tribunal initiated as well. Thank you. And the last speaker would be colleague uh, Richard Howitt. Three things said by the Syrian refugees our group is hosting in Strasbourg last night. I quote, we don't believe in the international community anymore. We are dying in camps because we have no food, milk or medicine. If you kept the humanitarian corridor open, I would be one of the first people to go back to Syria. And who would have thought we would seek safe haven in a country like Yemen? President, the Conservative spokesperson this morning, who I do respect, said of the Syrian refugee crisis that Europe must show solidarity and recognise our moral imperative, repeating the exact words of the British Prime Minister at the G20 meeting. Yet Britain is not amongst the 12 EU countries who have offered resettlement to Syrian refugees, and at the recent protest of Syrian refugees trying to enter Britain via France, the UK border agency said, again I quote, illegal migration in France is the responsibility of the French authorities. I say in this debate that I don't know what definition of solidarity there is which says that 60% of resettlement in Europe is borne by two countries not including my own. And I don't know what definition of morality exists which says that Syrian refugees are living in desperation in their own region but become illegal migrants in, within our own. Thank you. And now I give the floor Michel Now I give the floor to Commissioner Barnier. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to thank you all for your questions, remarks, uh, proposals, and I welcome the tone of this debate. I'd like to respond to the appeal for a European Humanitarian and Refugee Conference. The European Commission certainly has sympathy for that call. Mr. Weber, Ms. Sargentini referred to the figures, the figures that come from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the most competent international organization in the question. Europe is asked to relocate 2,000 people and uh, take in 10,000 people and I have thanked a number of countries which responded positively to that call and you are calling upon other EU member states to follow suit. The UNHCR is there on the ground and is in the best position to measure the need. Mr. Lopez Aguilar talked about humanitarian visas. We have called for the most generous use of the humanitarian visa. However, I need to remind you that it is the sovereign right of every member state to decide whether or not to use the humanitarian visa device. It's a sensitive issue a humanitarian and refugee conference would be useful in that it would allow this sensitive issue to get an airing. It should be more than just a sovereign matter for every member state. We all know how difficult the political discussion is in the member states. There's a great deal of populism out there. The conference would uh, uh, give the debate a wider airing, allow an exchange of good practice and I think these uh, subjects would be less of a taboo if we could all tackle them together rather than in isolation. Mr. Engel, Ms. Nainsky referred to the frontline countries, uh, Cyprus, 
Greece, Italy and Bulgaria. We have sent delegations to those countries to evaluate the technical and financial needs there. Ms. Yanaku and Mr. Salavrakos were quite right in relation to Greece and the asylum system that Greece needs to consolidate over and above receiving technical and financial assistance from other EU member states. Madame Guillaume talked about the need for more money. Well, I said that too. As Commissioner responsible for ECHO, I have to say there is no money left for 2013. We've reached the limit and there is no more that can be done in 2013 and for 2014 we will need more funding but we're aware of the budgetary constraints. Hence my enthusiasm for the conference you mooted. Mr. President, Honourable Members, Minister, in conclusion, I have thanked the Mayor and population of Lampedusa for the courage and dignity they have shown as Ms. de Kaiser quite rightly said, there are many EU civil servants, there are many UN officials in Beirut, in Damascus, there are many NGOs. I listed the NGOs. There are many people in the background who are doing their bit. We have already uh, deployed 2 billion euro in the region. 44% of the aid has gone to Syria. That aid is being channeled through the NGOs and what's left of the administration there. Many of these people are working in difficult conditions. Sometimes their lives are in danger. The terrible situation in Syria requires us to act in concert. There should be no uh, piecemeal approach, uh, nor should it be a case of each country looking after itself. So we have to take a holistic view. We have to deploy all the tools in the box, humanitarian assistance, help for neighboring countries, civil protection, uh, we have to root out terrorism and trafficking and do more in development assistance. We also need to receive refugees, look after uh, the refugees in uh, a proper and dignified manner. There is a very serious political dimension to all of this as is evidenced by the debate in the member states, I think a European political debate on this issue would be welcome rather than 28 separate, juxtaposed and sometimes contradictory debates. Thank you for your contributions. Of the Council, Deputy Minister of uh, European Affairs, Vitautas Leskevicius. Madam President, Commissioner, Honourable Members, I'm grateful for the exchange of views we were able to have today. The EU and uh, its member states are doing much in the given circumstances to alleviate the suffering facing the refugees from Syria. But of course, we shouldn't, we cannot be complacent because more than 2.1 million Syrians have already gone through the traumatic experience of becoming a refugee. Yet another 1.4 million people are predicted to flee the country by the end of the year, and we do not know how many will follow in 2014. Of course, the best way of preventing the suffering of those people would be 
to help address the reasons why they are fleeing the country. The best solution, of course, would be a lasting peace deal. And uh, let me point out at this place that the Lithuanian presidency, since the very start, from day one of our presidency, was very actively engaged uh, with the issue of Syrian crisis. And the joint Vilnius statement that was adopted last month at the Gimnish meeting is a good example of a common European action in searching for a lasting solution. And the Lithuanian presidency continues active cooperation with the high representative and the vice president of the commission and the EEAS, other stakeholders, to bring back peace and stability to Syria and the whole region. Failing that, as the fighting goes on, we must use all channels at our disposal to make sure that the international humanitarian law is respected and the civilians are protected. There must be zero tolerance regarding the killing, maiming, abduction and recruitment to armed groups of children and zero tolerance regarding sexual and gender-based violence whose most frequent and most vulnerable victims are, of course, women and children. All parties must ensure the safety and protection of all humanitarian workers and medical personnel. They should facilitate free passage of medical supplies to all areas and safeguard all health facilities and ambulances. Syria should provide the necessary authorization to scale up humanitarian operations within the country, while all parties must facilitate unimpeded access to humanitarian workers, to people in need throughout Syria, through all possible channels, including cross-border assistance as required by operational necessity. On the EU side, we need to support and reinforce UN Archer Central role in coordinating humanitarian assistance in order to strengthen efforts in ensuring efficiency and effectiveness of aid. This is key given the urgency of the situation and the severe financial constraints. If we can achieve at least this objective, it is my sincere hope that we will see refugee numbers rise more slowly than predicted and hopefully they might even start to decrease again at some point in the not distant future. Now, concerning the very concrete proposal by Mr. Uh, Fairhofstadt uh, for a hum humanitarian conference as it uh, was set out uh, in the Parliament resolution, I certainly welcome the proposal. Furthermore, I welcome the positive response given by the Commissioner Bernier and the Presidency is ready to work closely on this issue with the Commission, which has the main responsibility for this issue. But a conference is not enough. The EU must keep Russia and other global players involved on the Syrian issue. They should share the responsibility in solving the urgent humanitarian problems in Syria as well. And let me use this opportunity to express my gratitude to Mr. Aguilar for and to the whole European Parliament for your very much needed and timely resolution. I believe that with, your, with you, with our joint efforts, a common stance, we will be able to help the Syrian people with a timely action bringing long-time solutions.
Colleagues, that concludes that debate. We've received one motion for a resolution and the vote will be held today at 11.30. The next item on today's agenda is Miss Bernier's report on recognition of professional qualifications and regulation on administrative cooperation through the internal market information system. In French, I'll now give the floor to our rapporteur, Bernadette Vernieu. Madame le Président. Madame President, Commissioner, colleagues, we are going to vote on this key text today, the fruit of a great deal of work in this Parliament with Commission, Council and of course stakeholders and civil society. When the internal market gave me the task at the beginning of the lifetime of this Parliament of leading the working party on professional qualifications, I would never have dared believe that four years later we would have achieved this result and I want to thank everybody who contributed to bringing it about. This directive is a real step forward in many areas, particularly as far as the creation of the European Professional Card is concerned, something I've been calling for for six years. This card should allow the procedures to be speeded up. Poor professionals, it should allow exchanges between authority, national competent authorities to be improved and will make lives for patients and clients safer because of better checking of diplomas and references. Despite some reluctance in member states, we have managed to bring this about. Despite some of the deadlines which the competent authorities said couldn't be met, we managed to get agreement. Madame Vernon, excuse me. Mrs. Vernon, would you mind speaking a bit more slowly, please? Continues question of training courses whether paid or not carried out abroad during in the context of a regulated profession we've got university exchange programs such as Erasmus and we need to make sure therefore that the content and goals of a training course be defined previously in writing that'll help students the question of the partial access to profession is very important in uh, and causing concern particularly in health professions we made it clear that the host state has to look at these things case by case and for reasons of overriding general interest can say no. The common training frameworks which I've been very keen on as other professionals have should really be a step towards automatic recognition. Just having seven professions which benefit from automatic recognition isn't just something which puts a a break on mobility, it's going to stop us developing a common approach to looking at the quality of training content, which will help Europe become more effective and more competitive. I think we come up with a much better tool, a more flexible one, better one than the common platform system we use now. The quality of training should also allow us to deal with the question of ongoing training, continuous training. I'm pleased you managed to reach an agreement making it mandatory for member states to guarantee that all professionals benefiting from automatic recognition can update their skills through ongoing professional training. We've also made it sure that the training, the overall platform for training will be leveled up when it comes to either length or course content but I won't go into details here but I do want to mention the question of midwives I'm pleased we managed to have the general education of 12 years for access to this profession despite the problem it might give in certain member states who have shouldered their responsibilities here Madam President we've also improved the question of training content and we've added the idea of pharmacological training too I want to refer to nurses as well we had lengthy and complex discussions on this before we reached a satisfactory compromise thanks to a skill list which qualified nurses need to be able to have achieved. This provides high standards, updated standards and stresses the independent exercise of the profession. This is a real step forward. Thank you to everybody who helped bring that about, including professional associations. This isn't something which is trivial because we're talking about the most mobile profession there. Finally, I want to mention provisions which help keep our citizens safe. Apart from the IMI system and the uh, card, 
which should allow us to better check or whether documents are authentic or not. It also looks at the question of language tests. It's vital for safety reasons and security reasons that we can make sure that people know languages properly, particularly in the health professions before they start work. This will be carried out under the supervision of the competent authority and has to be limited to an official language. That will help patients without discriminating against professionals. Thank you for listening to me and I do hope we have a day debate which is commensurate with the importance of this text and its future of Europe. Thank you. Yes, it does. Commissioner Barnier. Merci, uh, Madame la Présidente. Les applaudissements à l'égard de Madame Vernier. Thank you. Madam President, the applaud is 